I'm really delighted to invite you to the first of this series of math encounters. And you'll see what that means during the course of the, during the, course of the evening. I, as some of you know, started my life as a mathematician and, and everything pretty much that I've done uh, from teaching and research and code cracking and even, and perhaps especially, money making has been based on math and so far it's all gone good. So it's a terrific subject. It's been terrific to me. It's a very old subject, as many of you presumably know. I assume that people could count before they could read. And I expect they could count way before they could read. Uh, the ancient Babylonians apparently knew the Pythagorean theorem. And 2,300 years ago, Archimedes reached remarkable heights of mathematical sophistication. So mathematics has been with us for a long, long time. Of course, by today, almost every aspect of modern society, whether it's engineering or medicine or telecommunications or manufacturing, not to mention all of the sciences, are based on or dependent on mathematics. It's hard to avoid. It's hard to, it's hard to stay away from it these days. Even modern art has been influenced as evidenced by the fact that today's speaker has pieces in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. So, uh, but mathematics is more than a tool. It's actually a living and breathing dynamic field. It's constantly changing, constantly growing more powerful. And more than that, mathematics has an inner beauty. It has a beauty. And we hope that through this series of encounters, and I expect you'll be here for every session, uh, we hope to acquaint you with both the power of mathematics and the beauty of mathematics. Now today, I'm going to introduce a fellow named Eric Demain, whom I, bet I met three minutes ago, uh, but I'd heard of before, and uh, who has one of the most remarkable biographies I've ever seen. He's a professor of uh, computer science at MIT, by the way, my, my alma mater. Uh, he joined the faculty at 20, so he was the youngest faculty member ever at the Institute. But it was six years after his bachelor's degree. And I don't know why it took him that long. Uh, to, I mean, six years is long to get to be a professor at MIT, but, but there he was. At 22, he was a MacArthur Fellow. And you know what the MacArthur awards are. So he's known as a computational geometer. You'll see what that means in a minute. But he's an expert on graph theory and aspects of game theory and computational complexity and, and God knows what else. Now, here's a remarkable statistic about this fellow. He has written four books, 106 journal articles, 23 book chapters, delivered 249 conference papers, written 24 technical reports, and nine manuscripts, which are, I suppose, in various stages of getting ready to go out and join that list. Not only that, he's created a lot of pieces of art. He just turned 30. Now, he's done perhaps three lifetimes worth of a normal person's work in, uh, well, I don't know when you'd start, but uh, whatever lies ahead, uh, if the past is prologue, uh, is going to be even more astounding. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Wow. Uh, well, thanks for the modest introduction. <laughs> uh, nothing to live up to. Uh, I'm Eric Demain, and I love math. Who's with me? Right. Glad you're on the same page. Uh, I want to tell you today about some work that I uh, have fun doing in the interaction between math and art and origami. 
Origami is a great sort of medium to bring these two subjects together. There's, of course, the art of making cool uh, paper folding sculpture. And there's the mathematics, the geometry underlying how paper folds. And it's a lot of fun to think about both actually at the same time. Uh, I do a lot of work with my father. That's the Martin domain here. And my background is in the mathematics side. His background is in the visual arts side. But we now do both. And we work together a lot on both the mathematics and the art. And uh, it's a lot of fun. Because when we get stuck proving mathematical theorems, it's like, well, this is too hard. Let's just make a sculpture and illustrate why this mathematical thing is so beautiful, why it's hard, why it's interesting, why it's complicated. And on the other hand, we, we think, oh, you know it would be really cool if we could build this. But then we think, does, that, does this even exist? How could we build that? And that leads to new mathematical problems. And so uh, the art we do inspires the math we do and vice versa. And it's really fun for us to pursue both at the same time. And that's the secret to being so productive. because. Uh, you can do uh, two things at once. Uh, now, unlike a typical math talk, but more like a typical art talk, I am going to start with uh, personal history and a little bit of background of how we came to this point. So our story begins uh, before I was born in the 1970s. Uh, and the, this is the Martin Domain Glass Studio. My dad was the father of uh, Canadian glass. Our first collaboration was when I was uh, five years old. That's me on the left. I look a little different now. Uh, my dad looks more or less the same. And we uh, had a puzzle company. And we made and sold these wire take apart puzzles across Canada. Uh, and it was fun. We, uh, we split the money 50-50. And it was a really fun, fun time. It was the beginning of my interest in puzzles and mathematics, perhaps. Uh, and then when I was ages uh, 7 to 11, so for about period of four years, we lived in 10 different places, mostly east coast of the United States, and uh, had a really fun time. I was homeschooled during this, this time, and that's when I started learning about mathematics and computer science and getting really excited about both. And uh, it was also really neat for me to see lots of different cultures within the United States and meet all sorts of different people from different kinds of backgrounds, different economic status, different uh, expertise, and I would just learn from my neighbors. And I got to see all sorts of different kinds of people and uh, interact with people of very different ages. It's another fun feature of homeschool is there's no real peer group. You just talk to everyone. It's a natural thing. And so in my research uh, now on the mathematics side, I've written papers with uh, 282 people, if you count them. Uh, and that's the, to me, that's the most fun part about doing mathematics is the collaboration with lots of people and sharing different ideas and sharing different expertise. I know a bunch of fancy tricks and all these people know a different set of tricks and I get to learn what they know and we get to combine our ideas to solve bigger and better problems. So that's a lot of fun. Uh, these days we're at MIT, been there for the last uh, 10 years. And uh, MIT is a, is a fun place for us because we get to combine, obviously there's a lot of science at MIT, it's what it's known for, but there's also a lot of art and there's a lot of students really excited about art projects and doing anything that sounds fun. So you could make a joke saying, ha ah, wouldn't it be funny if we made this? And five people will be like, yeah, let's do it. So uh, you'll see a bunch of those kinds of projects today. Uh, and uh, there's also a lot of tools and toys for we call them toys, but, you know, serious machines for building robots and fancy important things. We like to use, appropriate those tools to make sculpture. Uh, one of those tools is actually a glass blowing studio. It's called the Glass Lab, to sound more technical. Uh, but, so I finally got to see my dad blow glass, and then I got sucked in uh, maybe half a dozen years ago, and now we blow glass together. These are a couple of pieces we made uh, just this year. Uh, and, of course, this is a talk about origami, so I should be talking about folding. You can also fold glass. This is a little preview of more to come about glass folding. This is all made while the glass is hot. Uh, but I actually want to talk about origami. So uh, the exciting thing about origami is that it's totally changed in the last 20 or 30 years. It used to be, this is, you know, but if you were a kid in the 1700s, you'd learn how to make an origami crane and maybe a couple of other models, but there really wasn't 
um, an art. It was just a craft. It was an experience to, for kids to do. Um, and this is some of the fancier things you could do at the time, which is to make several cranes out of one square paper by adding some cuts. Uh, this is ancient origami. It's probably like this since uh, 2,000 years ago, almost. Don't know exactly when it started. But in the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen origami like this. Uh, each of these is folded from one square of paper, no cuts. Three-headed uh, servers uh, dragging with about a thousand scales. This model, I'm told, took over a year to fold off and on by one of the leading Japanese, young Japanese designers, Satoshi Kamiya. Uh, amazing stuff. And every year, there's even more origami that we, I mean, just blows our mind what we think is possible. Uh, here are some more. Examples. This was a design competition to fold a sailboat a few years ago. And you could take uh, a square piece of, all folded from one square of paper. Uh, you could take a square piece of paper that's white on one side and brown on the other and fold the sail, different color from the, the bottom of the boat, people of two different races. Uh, you could fold cross relief. You could fold the sailboat with the sails closed, which is technically challenging. It's not like a square of paper. Or you could fold the sailboat with the sails open. Again, uh, different color change there. Or you can fold a sailboat being attacked by a giant kraken <laughs> all from one square of paper. Yeah. Top three uh, MIT students. Um, so, it, I mean, it's, it's really crazy. Now, when you want to design a complex origami model like this, you don't just sit down and start folding. You, you think about what is the structure of my paper? What's going to go where? How do I fold something like this? So, for example, here's a relatively Butterfly by a uh, great MIT origami designer, Jason Koo. Uh, again, one square of paper. And this is roughly how you fold the butterfly. Not exactly, of course, but there's uh, a theory to how different parts of the paper here map to different parts of the fold model. So I haven't analyzed carefully, but I'm pretty sure these are the <coughs> wings. And then this is the head. Some antenna, and so on. Um, so, Orionists understand how to plan what parts of the paper are going to go to what parts of the model, and they do that using mathematics. Whether they like it or not, they are all mathematicians. Not necessarily thinking in a mathematically rigorous way, but using mathematical tools to figure out how to design their crazy creation. And in particular, uh, most modern origami design uses a method called the tree method of origami design, which you can think of like this. You start with a stick figure. Maybe you want to make a lizard. You said, oh, it has a head, it has a tail. That blue picture just sort of gives you, it's like the three-year-old drawing of a lizard. And then you give that to your algorithm, your computer program. It's called TreeMaker. You can download it for free. And it will say, well, here's how you fold a square of paper into a shape whose projection is exactly that stick figure. And so that gives you the paper sort of roughly in the right shape, and then you just have to do some math, some artistry to make it look like a lizard. It's almost a lizard. So for example, maybe you want to fold a scorpion, you draw some complicated stick figure for the scorpion, it's Pinterest and so on, you give that to the computer, it says, here's your crease pattern, you fold it, it looks like this, and it's not so obvious that these are the same thing, like projection, and uh, then just a little bit of shaping, and you get your scorpion. Easy. <laughs> now, to, for origami artists, this, is, this has been revolutionary, and it's extremely powerful. It gets paper in all the right places. But as a mathematician, it's a little unsatisfying, because how do you go from here to here? And obviously, art should come in at some point. But I think the more power you can give the artist, the more you can automate, the farther the artist can embellish beyond that. And so we. Uh, been thinking about, well, just if I want to say, well, fold me, fold me a scorpion, I want to say exactly what I want to fold, how can I do it? So just what shapes can you fold from a square of paper? Well, for starters, it turns out you can take any flat shape you want to make, which we call a polygon, you can fold that out of a square piece of paper. 